Does anybody have a question for one of the panellists? First of all, thank you very much for coming here. In 2019, I was invited as a keynote speaker to a major science conference on climate change in Prague, and I got to be able to challenge the UN modeling system. So my question is this, why are you saying follow the science? As if the science is not corrupt, as if the UN is a source of truth and wisdom, we know from COVID that it's very far from that. And yet, that is what's happening. There are lots of sciences, plural, and lots of scientists, plural. And what we have seen is that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has is, <laughs> created a, an establishment view of climatology. So I mentioned in my talk that that has been somewhat carbon reductionist. It's therefore downplayed the role of deforestation in nucleating cooling clouds and how that's a global phenomenon. I would add there's something else, and you probably know this then because you've, you've worked on this. To try and create a simple narrative with the idea that the politicians and the world needed a simple narrative We've been encouraged to think of carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere like a thermostat. If you turn them down, you'll turn down the temperature. That's not true. Carbon dioxide warms the atmosphere, but so do many other factors. And um, the crucial thing that has been overlooked by establishment climatology is the, what I call, and I think a few other people call, the carbon lag. So prior to humans screwing with the atmosphere the last 200 years and putting 50% as much CO2 in the atmosphere, world temperatures changed. And when temperatures went up, the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere typically rose two to 300 years later. Different theories on that. One idea is that a warming ocean would release more carbon dioxide. Where I depart fundamentally from the climate hoaxes and the stories in light newspaper is to say that that is somehow good news. It's not. It's terrible news. It means that not only might we have some committed warming from existing CO2 in the atmosphere that hasn't fed through in its total warming effect. We also might have some committed carbon from existing levels of warming. So we're not in control. There's been this narrative from establishment climatology that we're in control. And therefore you often hear people say every little bit of carbon dioxide kept from the atmosphere is a good thing. It would be lovely if that was the case, but it's not true. We, it's, we don't know. So we should really try and we should try and get as much carbon dioxide out, out of the atmosphere as possible. We should look at what to do with methane. We should reforest. We should do agroforestry. Uh, we should even have an open-minded conversation about certain types of geoengineering in case what we're seeing in the last two months with world temperatures and sea ice loss, and which is quite scary. I, for me, I'd like us to be more curious and less tribal and I've been on the receiving end of very tribal behaviors from establishment climatologists who thought how dare you I'm a professor of sociology what on earth are you doing <laughs> talking about, about about five years ago talking about about climate change and critiquing the models and so on um, so I I'm I and many other people are not seeing there's a monolithic science from established institutions. I am not seeing there as a lack of politicking and self-interest of institutions. No, there is. But where I end up is that actually it's, it's actually potentially more scary than what we're being told. Um, but that's my view, that's my interpretation and I understand if other people come to other conclusions. Um, I want to just check if anyone else wants to say anything in response to your question, the 
why are we sort of upholding science as one monolithic thing? Thank you. So I don't want to say anything about the science. I'll leave that to you. Um, no, thank you for speaking up. I just wanted to say something about our wonderful community and our healing spaces and our shamanic uh, teachings and offerings. Uh, yes, we've been doing all that and it's a great place for it. What I'd like to see is it offered further to other communities in our community that don't usually get to, to have those very needed um, therapies and also you know, a lot of it is done for tourists, a lot of it is done for, for a lot of money. It would be nice if that was the norm because part of the system that is breaking is, um, is a health service, is our mental health service. I mean, say what you will about it in uh, how, it, how it actually was in the first place, but these things are really needed right now, um, more so than ever. So it would be wonderful if these things were made uh, more freely. I just wanna say I'm slightly surprised by the question. Um, because, unless I'm mistaken, nobody said follow the science and nobody used the term net zero today. And what I've heard from my panelists and from myself is a lot of story about community and a lot of story about breaking out of paradigms and a lot of story about understanding that the things that we have to do are going to have to be plural and diverse. So I'm almost surprised that that question came up at all. I feel like we've been almost at a different conference <laughs> because that wasn't what I heard. Um, let's chat after and understand how we came to sort of very different understandings of that. Extinction Rebellion came from a prayer, from my point of view, like as a co-founder source person for the movement, it came from praying with the medicines and being in that way, you know, that has been part of the foundation, but it's also something that gets rejected in the movement as being too woo-woo is the thing that gets said, you know. Hmm. It's part of the soullessness, I think, but also we do, that's why I enter the shamanic through the science. I just think it's a, a thing. As a, I, I have a PhD in molecular biophysics, so I can get away with doing a bit of science to look like I know what I'm on about. Anyway, um, the other thing is, I, I appreciate Dougal Hines' new book. Um, I've forgotten the title of it, but he talks very much about scientism as a phenomena uh, in that and, in the, in, and within the climate movements. I think if you haven't read it, it'd be music to your ears. I think it might feel like a repair. I, I, I really sort of think of that phrase, listen to the science, as being a Greta Thunberg phase, f phrase. And, um, but I would also say that part of what Extinction Rebellion has done and what I was alluding to today was use some simple language and some simple demands at times to try and cut through something. And what I hear in that is um, um, saying to the system, can you stop lying to yourself? You know, that's what I hear in that. It's not, it's not a sort of celebration of all, as, as a person who's been a scientist, you know, like I know what goes, all the silo in, all the bullshit, you know, as a working class woman in science, I've got scars, right? So I, I don't hear it being a full on celebration of science. I hear it saying, you're just like on a basic level, the story of modernity and progress and all the rest of it is based on this idea that we're rationally thinking about everything. And I just hear Greta Thunberg saying, you're just a bunch of fucking bullshitters. Just even listen to the science, would you? That's how I take it. One of the things Extinction Rebellion did, and it, it used to make me cringe, but it was saying like, oh, you know, we're this movement who are doing this for the first time. You're like, you we're, we're on the shoulders of the road, anti-road protests and the anti-fracking. Just this arrogance that comes with success and there's hubris. Hmm. And um, I think people were on the receiving end of that who've been, you know, our movement was, grown from the tireless work of, or probably tireful work of many people over many years in the green movement in the UK. Like it was birthed from that. And it sort of can be quite extractive, uh, that as well. So for anybody who's felt harm from that and sidelined and XR sucked up all the oxygen, well, get over it, XR, because that's happening with JSO now anyway. So. <laughs> anyway. Uh, anyway. It really is about coming back together, breaking together, isn't it? So lots of love. Blessings on your life. And I just want to uh, welcome what you said about non-hierarchical ways of gathering. And of course this, you know, you're all seated there and apart from the session we just had, it's been a quite traditional mode of, of, of gathering. And uh, yeah, I fully support, you mentioned sitting in circle. So 
Initially, when I came to the conclusion I had five years ago, for me it was all about that. And I haven't mentioned the Deep Adaptation Forum, but that kind of philosophy, non-hierarchical, open-hearted, open-minded connection with other people, is central to the forum and the modalities it's developed. And so you, if you're interested in that, would you be willing? Yeah. Kim, Kim Hare, would you put your hand up? So Kim does quite a bit of work with the Deep Adaptation Forum, and so um, sitting in the front here, if you're interested, then please talk, talk to Kim. What would each of the panellists reclaim to embellish their joy of living? I did it, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. I am in a place in my life where I feel like I, there actually is nothing left to reclaim. I'm in quite literally carving out a job, uh, a work, a role, single-handedly, that only grew because of community support, which was just, you know, this wonderful uh, dynamic. Um, by doing that, I reclaimed my freedom. I reclaimed a sense of purpose. I reclaimed a community. Uh, I reclaimed a great joy in my work, in my speech, in my writing. Um, by putting all of me forward to, into this, I used to use the word fight, but that doesn't really seem right anymore, into this way, this way of being, and this way of being together. It is profoundly joyful, even though I spend all day thinking about the world ending, you know? <laughs> um, so... I can only say, if any of you feel in your heart that there is something to reclaim, do it. It's real good. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me, actually. Uh, yeah, I reclaim my town. Yeah. <laughs> I, I reclaim my town and uh, from the, the jaws of... of um, some tired old thinking, to be able to, to hold it and to, to help be the Ellen of the ways and, and to, to find a way out. And I get to sit in meetings that I chair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I get this control. No more living in fields in wet tents being shouted at. Um, yeah, no, now I have an ac access all areas pass in this town and, and I... I get to I get to choose it. I get to choose the plan. I thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm living my thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much for letting us have already reclaimed it. Because it's like ah, oh, trying to think of something, and then so distracting. Because my dog's crying. To, he wants to be on stage. Um, <laughs> so he's just, if you let him go, he'll just run. There we go. He's reclaiming his freedom. <laughs> Someone's going to have to pass him up. <laughs> there we go, Shambo. Well done. Um, so, funny story. I didn't actually like dogs before I got one, but um, they're pretty amazing. And um, people in England don't know about chihuahuas. I always wondered why, like, Hollywood stars that could have everything, have them, but it's because they're super intelligent and sweet and, and really quite amazing. So a little shout out for chihuahuas there because um, when you walk a chihuahua around the southwest of England, people do say things like, oh, look, she's walking her rabbit. <laughs> um, so uh, for me, I'm going to say that the, the thing that I've reclaimed is beauty and, and beauty as a value. And, and I really feel that beauty is... It's really the highest of the spiritual values and, and ways of being that we have. And we all know, we all know what, beauty, that, what that real experience of beauty is when we, when we see a sunrise or a sunset, when we, when we look into the eyes of someone that we love, when we, when we have those moments that are just so transcendental that you feel all of that aliveness in you. Um, and when I, when I called my podcast, The Future is Beautiful, that's what I was speaking to, that it doesn't really matter the what, it doesn't matter what happens, the stories, it's, it's are you able to experience the beauty in that moment? 
And there is so much beauty in grief. There is so much beauty in death. There is so much beauty in these moments of transition. And, and for me, that's been the biggest reclamation. If I was to give you a list of all of the things that have happened in my life, especially in the last like three years, you'd just be like, what is this? How is this woman smiling? And it's because of that, it's because of that reverence for beauty. It's because of that deep respect of being alive and what a gift that is. And, and then with that, being able to really experience something beautiful and powerful in, in all of the moments and, and in all of the shadows. Um, and so, yes, let's reclaim beauty. Um, my partner's going to cringe. Um, has anybody heard me call myself... Gail Overshare in Bradbrook. <laughs> Gob for short. <laughs> it turns out it turns out it's a trait. It turns out it's a trait. Um, so did I mention the menopause already? <laughs> uh, well one of the see one of the things uh, in my life uh, was there was a lot of unkindness. And um, it's taken me a long time to actually really like, know what I like because there was so much wanting to seek approval and to feel safe in the world, you know? So uh, it makes you do a lot of strange things. Um, I was like a real proper girly swat. I missed a Nirvana concert to revise once when there weren't even exams happening. That's what about I was. Anyway, as part of this transition process that I'm in, I thought I'd quite like to understand my own neurodivergence. So I'm about to come out as somebody who's probably autistic. Um, not very... Uh, who knows, right? I don't know how that stuff works, but it was just like... Duh, <laughs> when you start watching the videos and tick, tick, tick. And one of the things um, with autistic people is that we have our special interests and like don't get in the way of our special interests. Like, like mine just happens to me be with the work that I do. And like if I want to talk about something, I fucking want to talk about it, you can't shut me up. And that, that's an issue actually. And if I don't want to talk about it in that moment, I don't, you know. And, and so it's been really <coughs> helpful to to understand that, it's apparently a lot of things that middle-aged women, because we do this thing called masking, uh, we, we, we've sort of learned how to hide these traits. So um, I am reclaiming uh, this. I don't really know what the thing is, whether it's ADHD or black, who knows? It's just another label, isn't it? But I'm neurodivergent. I fucking love my brain, actually. <laughs> and when I meet other people who you can just boom, boom, boom with stuff, it's great. And um, you just don't tell me to shut up when it's gone over the top and it's a bit too much oversharing. My partner's really great in bed. Um, <laughs> I think I want to reclaim the idea that I can be small. Like, I've grown up in a culture where you know, success, impact, scale. And wow, it's, it's led to a, an interesting life. Bold decisions, um, maybe courageous decisions, crazy work hours, no work-life balance at times. But yeah, I think that's been the, the enemy of me just enjoying being alive. So when I talked about the identity issue and relinquishing the scholar and stuff and being a crap musician and a crap farmer, it's reclaiming that it's okay just to do something which might seem not particularly that consequential, but that's okay. So yeah, that's what I'm left with. And not being sat in front of a laptop for a year might mean that everything changes in my life. Who knows? My neighbour was collapsing. I had to cancel my day 
and spend a day with her. And I was so angry. <laughs> I was so angry and I spent the whole time trying to stay calm and kind and thoughtful with this person who was falling apart because she'd been lost a carer. She had no care at the weekends. She couldn't get a carer. And she just sits in her house. She used to be an artist and she can't do it anymore. And it's just like, this is what it means to me. Collapse is just happening everywhere. There are so many people that need help. So if there are any advice, I mean, it's just such a challenge. I don't know, whatever you want to say. Thank you so much for, for, for bringing care into, into the space. And isn't it funny how we have to have like a whole kind of private industry for this thing that just is so human and, and, is, and, and really needs just to be part of life. Um, so I've been caring for my mum for the last three years and, um, and we have some resources so we're able to have support and yet it's, it's still a lot, especially when you're dealing with some of the really horrific illnesses that are becoming more prevalent now, um, such as Parkinson's and dementia. And, um, and, it, and to me, it really points out, you know, I, I, I love these moments with my mum. Like, it's quite, uh, it's quite a, it's, it's a really special thing to be with someone in that level of vulnerability and, and watching somebody, like, someone's, ego and body dissolve in different ways and and their 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 brain like it's it's um it's an experience like that yeah I, it's moved me more than most things than anything else really in my life to to be part of this experience um, and it's really hard and it's really hard to find people that you can talk to about it and all of the services are so overrun and in my own life, it's, it's also like, I want to have a child, but I'm looking after my mum, who's only 76, and now I'm 40, and I haven't had a child yet, and I'm just finding myself completely caught in all of these timelines being wrong, because we have stopped doing things how humans always did them, um, in certain timelines, and, and also because so many of us move from place to place, and so we don't have the... The, the ancestral support systems that may have been in place because my parents are, were, were immigrants, it means that there, there are no aunties and uncles and all of that kind of thing. Um, and, so, and so I share all of that just, just to say, like, it's really broken. And, and I feel like this is one of the, you know, I've, I've done things in my life and been on stages and TEDx talks and been part of glamorous things. And this is quite honestly, like the most um, profound um, experience that I've ever had. And a lot of my friends, you know, they'll be like, you know, why are you doing this to yourself? And like, you know, and, and, and you know, and I feel like it's so innate for us to want to love each other and care for each other and, and, to, and to be with each other. And we are at a time where we're so under-resourced. And, and also, as you were saying, Indra, like where, where there's money, it's not necessarily like to the right kind of like treatments or things that might actually help people. Um, and, um, and you were saying about Vanessa saying that it will show up in our mental health and our physical health and, um, one of the things I had last year was pesticide poisoning, which I got in Somerset because I was living in a farmhouse and they sprayed glyphosate on the fields like all around the house. The house was moldy and maybe because I was run down from caring for my mum, blah, 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 blah. It just like affected me. And, and so we are really like living um, in a time where it's coming from so many different angles. Um, and I don't really have the answer to, to this one um, except... You know, Jeremy Corbyn says we need a national care service, like we really do. Um, but how how is that possible when our when our health service is crumbling? Um, and so I I don't really know how we do it 
on a on a level that isn't kind people doing what they can for their neighbors uh, and um, and knowing that that's not really ever going to be enough um, so yeah that's so just I just want to say just like a bit of solidarity to everyone that is that is that is caring for, for someone or that will one day find themselves in that situation because it's not always something that you plan for um, and and that yeah, this is this is one of the ways we create a more beautiful world. Can I just jump in quickly? Thank you for reminding us um, about things being connected. So the housing system. So we don't have the space um, to care for our elderly. And equally, and I grew up in this town, and when I got to a certain age after school, I couldn't afford to live here, so I had to move away. Um, and this, this is what's happening. So it's that, I'm not saying we can't all be community, you know, without our children and our parents, but it is a huge part of it, not actually having, having that connection. Um, I will just say um, also, so there's a care home, local care home, another one's shut down. Um, it wasn't a great shakes. My daughter worked there and... Um, yeah, there were various things that were exposed as, as not being great. You know, people are overworked, doing night shifts, and there isn't the capacity. These things are done for profit. Um, there, is, there will be a huge, need, very, a huge need very soon. It's coming. Um, and I think finding out what we actually do have is a good step. Let's find out the provisions we do have um, and the services we do have. And it's also about networking these together. And so, yeah, to, to just find out that the stats, if you like, what we have, what we need, what is missing, I think would be a great start. And it's a system that's very financialized. Um, Nick Shackson's book, The Finance Curse, uses the care system as an example of what Jen's talking about in his book about the money power and how it's, uh, yeah, how it's destroying the planet. That's one of the ways. Um, Charles Eisenstein tells this story of uh, the guy, I can't remember his name, who started Adbusters and was involved in um, starting the Occupy movement, seeding the Occupy movement. So it did all this amazing stuff, great things in the world, and then Charles met him and said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm caring for my dying auntie. And he didn't know how long that was going to take, years, I think. Um, and it was that, you know, in the way, if you know Charles Eisenstein's work, he talks beautifully about, I think he's really speaking to morphic resonance, if people know Rupert Sheldrake's work. That um, we can think we're doing these grand things like, Gems indicating, you know, especially if you've had profile, and it, you've got to really mind the addiction to that stuff, by the way. It is a, a force. Um, and it's when we're doing, when we're in love, when we're acting on, on love, and what that does in the world, and how we don't even really understand that now. What does that do in the world when you act genuinely on love with nothing? It's not, it's not with a reason. It's not going to, you know, as Charles Eisenstein said, this. Guy's auntie was going to die. That's, that was the deal. Um, and I think we, because the world at large does not honour our caring work, I'm a mom, two boys, and we have to find that for ourselves and honour that for ourselves. First main point, um, and each other, that being led by love is what we've been talking about today. Um, and then the second thing... Um, because I, really, I related to your story. Our colleague, Skeena Rathor, is not here today, and I work very closely with her, and she made a choice to, to take some time out after some difficult... Lots had happened in her family, Just not to speak about her, I'm not here too much, but... Um, so it was already a thing. I wasn't going to get to work with her for a while, and then she got unwell. She's unwell at the minute. Uh, and... I'm very, very blessed to be in the women's networks in Stroud. We have this thing, the Stroud Sisterhood suddenly started on Facebook. It's got 3,000 women in it. Um, and the women's networks are very powerful in Stroud in terms of people taking care of each other, reaching out for each other. 
And I don't quite know if there's a model, but it's really just about the intention. And what's happened around my friend Skeena is a village is taking care of her. And it's been a really uh, a thing to watch and participate in. Because part of me just went, perhaps like you did that day when your neighbor had a collapse, fucking hell, you know, like nothing I need type of thing. Part of that ha happened for, for me. And um, it, it hasn't been, it's been a joy to give in to that. It's been a joy because it's been shared. And that's going to be the way. We just have any villages of, uh, interconnected villages of sharing and support. I think, I think that's what's going to emerge through the intention of love, through connection, uh, through what we know with our female bodies. And I, I'm not sidelining the men here. I'm just saying that that's the rising feminine in all of us, you know. I just want to say quickly that the one resource we all have all the time is the power of story and what, how we choose to see events as they unfold and by reframing them, how we then choose to engage with them. So my mum and I historically had a pretty fucking tough time. And when I was a teenager and a young woman in, her early 20, in my early 20s, I decided that, you know, I would never take time out of my life to help her when she needed me because she was never there for me when I needed her. About three months ago, she broke both of her wrists and her shoulder. And luckily for her, I've done a lot of therapy and an ayahuasca trip. <laughs> um, so there I was. And I found myself, uh, it was only six weeks that I was there for her while her uh, cast were on and I was working full time um, and looking after her and actually doing Gem's course at the same time. Um, and it wasn't always easy, but I was so damn happy to be doing it. Like, wow, cool, look how far we've come. Look how far I've come. Look at what we can do together. How lucky am I that I have a kind of work that means I can run up to Scotland and just do that for six weeks or work odd hours to fit stuff in. How lucky am I that I have a parent who's willing to accept help when she needs it? How lucky am I to be the kind of person that is willing to try and like re-narrate her life in order to do these things? Because the word that stood out to me was angry. And I'm no anger. I've been very, very, very angry. And we always have to ask ourselves why. And that's maybe the one question that can set us free because we always have a choice, even when it feels like we don't. Because if we go into a situation and we feel like we don't have choice, we will do it, but we will feel resistance. And that creates anger. But when something happens in front of us and we kind of have no choice but to engage, but you still choose to with all of you, with every single part of you, then that can release anger. Then that creates a sense of self-empowerment. And I think that's a resource we all have all the time through the power of how we choose to see ourselves and the world. And if there's one thing we need right now, it's stories of how we all have the capacity to love each other and how wonderful it is to love each other today. Okay, um, we've only got half an hour left uh, and we've got some questions to go through here. It may be that these are a little bit quicker because people just have things they want to say. So, Kimberly. When I walked into that room with the flip charts, um, and, and I wrote it on the flip chart, and it's already been mentioned quite a lot, but I wanted us to really focus on reclaiming our joy. Um, my two favorite quotes, I have them on my wall at home. Um, one is the E.B. White one, which is, you probably all know these. Every morning I awake torn between the desire to save the world and the desire to savor it. And then I realize that if I don't ever savor it, there's kind of nothing worth saving. And my second quote is Wendell Berry. Be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I think it's so important, I spend a lot of time working with burned out activists um, who have forgotten their joy. And I think when we reclaim that for ourselves, we don't burn out or we burn out less. And this is not to say grief isn't important as well, because it really is, but so is joy. Thank you. My 
question is, um, do you have any suggestions about how we can avoid the growing grassroots radicalization being hijacked by the institutions, like the government or... But, but institutions, because I prefer that. Just quickly, um, just, just, you just got to keep moving, right? So every time, because this is great, this is what's so great about the movement, because the movement pushes and then government and institutions go, oh shit, yeah, no, that's what people want. Okay, we'll move a little bit towards it. And it's like a dance. Every time institutions move, we've got to move further, further to the left, further to radical, further to everything. So it's recognizing that dynamic and using it almost in a way to like help shape part of the direction that we go in. Um, because there's no way to actually impinge them from doing that. The only choice that we have is how you respond. Follow the money. Just in, uh, in, uh, educate people to follow the money. If there is money behind it, it doesn't come from a good place. So I kept talking about um, the social economics. That this is social economics. Nobody here is, is being, everyone is giving their time voluntary. You know, this is how we bring it together. So if it's got that in its base, then yeah, it's tell people. Yeah, thank you for bringing the question. I, over the last few years, became more and more concerned at what some people call techno-authoritarianism, techno-feudalism, global American big tech corporations um, controlling our lives. We've all sort of just gone along with it with convenience, with mobile phones and electronic payments and so on and on. on. Uh, so yeah, that was, as you say, Gail, was a, a big motivation for me to write everything that's in the second half of my book and to actually talk about a freedom-loving environmentalism or a people's environmentalism, not a corporate one, not an elitist one. Um, and in saying that, um, I worked for um, 23 years thinking that what we needed to do to achieve sort of sustainability was to engage business and banks and uh, get people to do the, the right thing for the wrong reasons. And, um, and I talk about it in the book, like what I've discovered is the one thing worse than the elites at Davos not taking climate change seriously is the elites at Davos taking climate change seriously. <laughs> um, so I've had to, so my journey has got me to the point of saying, let's not end up just squabbling about what I call the fake green globalists and let's just get on with building our own people's led environmentalism um, and so yeah that's now where I'm at and that's why I'm so pleased to hear today about all the different local initiatives that are happening in Glastonbury. I'm welcoming of the the skeptical view of authority and corporations and how they might be using a sense of climate crisis for their own ends. I welcome that yeah absolutely I'm, I'm but I want that to lead somewhere, our own agenda, not just, com not just complaining about, you know, and not getting anything done. I have a question that, about what else fits alongside what you've had to say today. So the question was, does the futures that you are envisaging, does it include washing machines? Does it include tractors? Does it include email? Because I have the perception that one of the biggest features in women's liberation in the last 60 years was the invention of the washing machine. So I'm wondering where the future of all of that systemically fits into how many people will be left supported on this planet as we go through the transition. 
Can I ask you back to the microphone? Um, the reason, thank you. Um, the reason I'm asking you back is I want to explore why we want answers to that question. Is it because we feel, we get a sense of um, almost like safety from having a, a rough idea of what's going to come? Or is it because we've got a sense of that, what you've just described, that can inform what we do now? Um, for me, I've decided not to care about the question you raised. I don't know. And I can still find things to prioritize and work on now. Uh, I am changing my own life uh, with the idea that global supply chains will break down and all the things you mentioned will not be available anymore within I don't know how long, but if I'm around in 10, 20 years, then I guess they're not around then. But I don't need to be right on that, and I don't need to be confident about my vision on that for me to choose to do the things I'm doing. So I'm interested in, when you ask that question, why? Because I love all the bottom-up sense that exists in everything that's being shared today. But I'm concerned that when we have, you know, whatever it is, 25 million people living in London, when we have people all over the world in large cities, when we have, whatever it is, eight, nine billion people on the planet who are supported by agricultural systems which are broken in all sorts of ways, but which they nevertheless depend on, there's an implication in Okay, not caring and accepting that people will die, that, that's, where, that's kind of where we are. <clears throat> but I also feel there's something that we need to hold in a not either or space around how we are with technology and even how we are with corporations that may make a huge difference to whether we end up with 3 billion, 2 billion or 1 billion. Yeah, I am not positing the idea of us uh, turning towards the local and self-sufficiency as um, meaning that we completely neglect uh, global policy, uh, for example. I think we do need a conversation involving the bottom-up about possible future geoengineering to try and repair the Arctic in order to stabilize the jet stream in order not to have a multi bread basket failure, which suddenly means we've got a billion starving, billion more hungry people. Um, uh, yes, so I'm, I'm open to that, absolutely. And I encourage that we, 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 we talk about that as well. I'm a bit jaded from that because I realize such conversations are hijacked by establishment interests. However, I appreciate people who've got the stomach for that fight and they'll try and advance non-compromise, non-bought-off um, contributions to working out what to do at an international intergovernmental policy level on things like the Arctic. I think it's not going to work and I think we are going to have a population collapse. That doesn't mean I don't care. Thank you. Can I jump in? Uh, brilliant question. And yes, basically. When we lived on camps, we had bicycle-powered washing machines. There are ways of doing it. And I love that you framed it in the way that, because women do mostly of the washing. So yes, in that way, I'm, I can't see that really changing. Uh, that's my pessimism. Um, so even if we're talking about it theoretically, yes? So Global South, uh, so in the time that we do have possibly, you know, not enough electric, however much electric is used um, in washing machines, it's a big, because it's about heating the water. So different ways of heating the water, different ways of spinning the machine. There are handheld ones as well. Um, personally, I'd still like to have dishwashers because it's, it actually uses less water, you know, than, than a whole household. 
And yes, it does free up. So there are ways around, and, and there will be, because I have lived on camps where if you don't do the washing up with a very high temperature, even if you keep your own cup, your own plate, your own spoon, it's amazing actually how difficult that is, um, yeah, the tummy bugs just go round. Okay, so it's a, it's a thing of cleanliness. Um, so I would like to, to say yes, if that's okay. Um, <laughs> but in the future, yes, we will just be a little bit more creative with it. Let's hear it for pedal-powered pedal dishwashers. It's a bit phallic, isn't it? Let's be honest. No, it, it wasn't intended that way, and, and it, was, it was given to me by my ex-wife. <laughs> it's, a, it's a penis, come on, it's obvious. It's, it's got pubic hair. Don't just make it me. Come on. It's in my brain on my high. It's a mushroom. Yeah, 3D printers. <laughs> it's it's Sorry, the least phallic t-shirt in the room, girl. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's got a penis in the middle of it anyway, okay, we'll talk about it later. Um, I, Not Meg's Curse by Amitav Ghosh is, I think, a brilliant book, and one of the things he's talking about in there is um, we sort of have this sense that the collapse will meet ease more readily here than has happened over... It's already happened in other places. Other places have worked it out. We're a lot more sort of dependent... Um, on, uh, yeah, like some of the, many of us, do, I'm sure not in Glastonbury, but don't know how to eat from the nature and to get herbs from there and so on, but you what? Bins, eat from bins. <laughs> Activists know how to eat. 20 years ago, I was living in Bristol, and if you remember back 20 years ago, there was a crisis. It was called the BSE crisis, and there was a collapse in the dairy, and the beef industry. And I sold my house in Bristol and I bought a single crop arable field. And it was that collapse of the dairy industry that allowed me to buy that because I had 28 and a half thousand pounds and that's all it was. And I got a 10 acre field and I turned it into a wildlife sanctuary and I lived on it and I'm living, I've lived there for 20 years off grid. And what difficult choice are you going to make to change the situation to the benefit of you and your community around you? What difficult choice are you going to make? Well, that's a question for everyone in the audience, isn't it, really? Because... Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, it's a good question to take, take with us. So I'm going to write it down. Thank Could you, I just Richard. ask Chloe to finish up by telling us all what the money that's going to the Glastonbury Mental Health Network is going to be spent on? Thank you. Um, I've been trying to get the whole of the high street trained in um, mental health, first aid and signposting because there's a lot of people who are working in shops, cafes, mm. pubs, who are doing frontline work. Mm. And I know as well as you do that mental health is not real, it's health, it's community, it's... And we set up as a mental health charity, but essentially we've been creating community with events and with training. So, um, your pounds have meant that we can now do the high street, and that's going to make Glastonbury a completely different place. So. Thank you. Okay, uh, it's 20 past, panel. Uh, we said we'd finish at half past. You know that we're going to go up to the White Spring for six o'clock. Any concluding remarks? Thank you for approaching me to do this here. And uh, thank you for pulling this off. It's been a wonderful pleasure. I couldn't have gone better. I've learned a lot and I've, I feel great gratitude. It was more my intention at the start of the day to feel gratitude. And so I do. So thank you. And to thank everyone else who's made this happen.
<clears throat> and what about my fellow speakers, eh? Well, hey. Can I say what uh, an incredible um, privilege it has been to have shared a stage? I was just stepping in um, for the uh, lovely Reverend who couldn't make it today, but it's been such an honour. I feel I am, yeah, in, in such good friendship. And to everybody here, um, thank you so much. I feel a real friendship, a kin kindredness, and a kind of resilient future. It gives me hope. Thank you so, so much. I've had a really good day, thank you. Um, I, I just can't let your questions go, because it's like, uh, you know, the neuro anyway. Um, <laughs> do people know that you can buy land with pensions, by the way? Because pensions are, as our Andrew Medhurst points out, <laughs> an act of fraud in the modern day. Um, that's one of the things that I made a choice to do, and it probably means that I've got, uh, you know, no financial backing, really, anyway, that thing. And then the other thing that I wanted to share, I suppose, as a closing thing, is this next month, I'm in court finally for taking a hammer and braddle to um, the Department for Transport. And the way the... Sorry, so it's not really one of those closing remarks, is it? But I just want to say it because I can't help myself. Anyway, um, it, it's a, it is a bit of a moment of making a decision, and it will be made in the moment how it goes. But what's happening to climate activists who are in court at the minute is that for some of us they're saying well you, first of all you can't protest they've made sewn up all the laws there and then when you get into court you, you, you don't have any defenses uh, people may know that the simple act of holding up a sign reminding jurors that they have a right to act on their conscience a sign that's on the wall of the old bailey was referred by the old bailey to the attorney general for review to see if it's perverting the course of justice There's, our, our legal system's under real threat at the minute and and, and if you Jem does a lot in his book on critical theory. Um, sorry, everybody's knackered again. They just want to go home or the white well and you're on one again. Uh, what again. can we do to help you? <laughs> Shut me up. Round up there. No, so basically what I'm trying to say is, uh, as part of my submissions in this particular case, we've drafted the law of conscientious protection. You know, people know Polly Higgins, right? She drafted the law of ecocide, but the other thing she brought forward, she was a friend of mine, I was blessed to have her in my life, was the law of conscientious protection, or the idea of conscientious, that's what we are. We, when we all say we're serving a higher law, this whole thing about coming from our communities, there's a practicality for me this next month, it's saying to this judge and the prosecution, like, that's the law that I'm, we've drafted it, that's the law that I'm serving, because what you're all up to is just a, like an obvious power game, um, and you listen to African jurors consuls saying, when everybody says follow the law, you say, well, whose law is it? Where did it come from? Uh, so it probably is going to get me in jail, this thing. So uh, it might not. Um, and it would just be, it's like a part of the purpose from my, what I'm hearing is from my, in myself, is it's a way to say we don't have a functional democracy. So um, I've got like a little telegram chat that's on my Twitter. I am in that thing. Um, if anybody wants to know what's going off and follow that, um, would appreciate support. There's a, a, a moment, you know, it's not all about being out there and being visible, but that probably is a moment where that might help. Um, thank you. I'm not going to jail, um, but I have a little thing to ask of you. I'm going to do some self-promo and promo of Amisha as well, because she hasn't grabbed the mic. So we both have podcasts, All That You Are and Planet Critical. All That We Are, sorry. All That We Are and Planet Critical. Please sign up, go and listen, enjoy them, learn, reach out to us and let us know what you think and how you feel. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you very much for your time. And I'm going to pass the mic to you. <laughs> Thank you.
I have to say, when I woke up this morning, and I was like, God, I've got to spend the whole day indoors with a bunch of doomsters, and I had no idea <laughs> what that would be, but I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I've really enjoyed meeting all of you and all of the little one-to-one -one moments we've had as well, so... Um, thank you for, for inviting me and um, for sharing this day together. Um, yeah, just real, real gratitude for, for each of you for your courage uh, and for, for what it is that, that you're bringing to the world. And I know we haven't had that space for you all to share. And... I also know that everyone in this room has something profound to offer and could be sitting here. When we are different of any sort, often when we just share, we trigger so much and, um, and then it, it gets taken in, in all kinds of other ways because we're all traumatized beings living in this system. And, and so, yeah, just, I just wanted to say that, that that's, I think, part of what we all need to, to, to recognize somehow. That, um, that, yeah, like, where can we find those points where we come together? And, and one of the places that we come together is that we are all imperfect human beings. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much for having me in Shambo. Mm -hmm.